saddle hunting for me has been a complete, and I hate even saying the word, uh, game changer for how I how I like to hunt. If you've been thinking about getting into a saddle, now is the exact perfect time to do it. You have the entire spring and summer to kind of dangle in the backyard and get prepared for the upcoming season, be able to practice all your shots, getting in and out of the tree, experiment with your different climbing options that you have uh, to lighten your load and be more mobile. If you're interested in getting hooked up and getting into a saddle, I would definitely be checking out Tethered. They have Two great saddles out. One is the new Phantom saddle, which is killer. It has a bunch of new comfort features that are built into it, as well as a utility bridge to kind of help with lengthening and shortening the bridge to make sure you have the optimum comfort. And you can get the uh, the OG, as I like to refer to it, uh, that I've been doing my hunting out of the past couple of years, which is the, the Mantis saddle. I might also recommend the Predator platform, especially if you're transitioning from a tree stand to a saddle. It gives, just gives you that little bit uh, sense of familiarity that you would have with a, a platform under your feet that you would have that would be similar to a uh, similar to a tree stand, and it made my transition a couple years ago really seamless from tree stand hunting to to saddle hunting. So, if you're interested in checking out more about saddle hunting in general, I would head over to tetherednation.com. Check out all their products. They have some killer YouTube videos. You will thank me later. The first thing I do in the morning before a hunt, before a scout, or just before getting ready for work is have my morning coffee, and I'm sure most of you out there listening are the same. Make sure you're filling your mug with Skull Brew Coffee as it is the only coffee company that is both 2% for conservation certified and donates 10% of its profits to conservation organizations to help secure the future of our wild places. So head to SkullBrewCoffee.com and choose between three killer roasts of coffee and know that you are supporting conservation with every sip. Welcome to the Truth From A Stand Deer Hunting Podcast brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 175. Today I'm joined by Brian Broderick of Day 6 Gear for our part two of our discussion, and we're diving into arrow builds and broadheads, so stay tuned. All right, all right, all right. What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you are doing well. Hope you are feeling fine on this 30th day of of April. It's the end of April. We're jumping into May. It seems just kind of crazy that it's, you know, we're we're almost to uh to summer and have to start thinking about you know some trail camera placement here in the not so distant future. Um, you know, probably be rounding out our plans for next fall as far as what states we want to hunt i was actually just having a conversation with my buddy mr chad sylvester from exodus outdoor gear yesterday as i was driving to scout and uh, just talking about our plans for the fall of course he and i are hunting together in um in in november um for sure but we were talking about possibly having a second hunt together um at a not sure exactly what state uh, but we just started kind of kicking the can around to, <clears throat> to see if maybe our schedules would match up to uh to make that happen so that's exciting to start to think about you know doing some planning for that the other part of the equation there is i know i mentioned in the last episode that you know locking in getting a kayak for some water access which i'm super stoked about um some of the areas i was looking at in out of state to hunt uh this this year you know i was focusing in and around water those are going to be you know um well the one state specifically is going to be all a freelance hunt so um, there's some, some good kind of crick bottoms and stuff like that on this particular piece, uh, which I'm pretty excited about. Cause I think that at least the way it lays out on the map, there's going to be very limited opportunities to get to some of the places, uh, by land that you're going to have to, uh, get there by, um, by water, especially if you want, um, you know, quiet access and it actually will save you a little bit of, 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 of hiking as well. But the second part of this, this isn't completely locked down, but one of the things I've been wanting to do for a little while is, you know, for a lot of the out of state trips that I take, you know, I'm often, you know, renting a cabin, you know, a cheap cabin. If, if, if there's one available, you know, I know I've mentioned in the past, Chad and I, you know, we've, we've rented an RV in the, not an RV, but uh, we've rented a pool behind camper for like, you know, seven to 10 days, depending on how long we we're going to be hunting. And that was all well and good. And sometimes I think the the pool behind campers probably a little bit more than we need, um, as far as you know space goes and, and and stuff like that. And what I've really been wanting to do and have been exploring is 
trying to figure out how to set myself up with some type of, you know, mobile, <clears throat> what I'll refer to as like the mobile, you know, DIY public land hunting rig. Um, and I'm, I'm a bit of a minimalist, but not so much so that, you know, tent camping, it, it's not out of the, out of the question. Um, but if I'm going to go on, you know, like say for example, the trip I was on in Iowa where I'm gone for, for two weeks, you know, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to. I don't want to run into nasty weather where it's like I have the possibility of getting wet and, and having to change my campsite and find a last minute place to dry out and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I want something that's kind of in between a, a, a camper and and a tent. And one thing that Chad and I used in years past was actually a pool behind box trailer. There wasn't anything in it to make it um, homey, if you will. It was literally just an empty box trailer, and we used cots and slept in it for seven days or whatever the case was, which worked out great. Um, but I was like, you know, if I could figure out a way to do something similar to that, but just kind of increase the uh, amenities to a degree to where, you know, you could spend two weeks in, in it if you needed to and, and and be just fine. And so that's one of the things I've been kind of kicking around. So I was looking at, you know, is there an opportunity to get a, you know, some type of box trailer that I can do just some minimal conversions to make it uh, livable for, you know, a, a few weeks at a time. Or the other option was, was, you know, do I or do I just kind of get a cap for my truck um, and start to outfit the back of that for a place for me to, for me to sleep. Now the back of my truck is big enough and I'm small enough <laughs> that I could actually lay down in that and, and, and sleep for like a day or two or whatever. And I've done that in the past, but I'm really more specifically thinking about some of these out of state trips where I'm going for, you know, a week, uh, you know, or weeks at a time. And I may have just kind of come across, um, an opportunity to pick up a, a box trailer for really, really ridiculously cheap. Um, I was hope I was wanting to really have something that was like a six by 12 or, you know, seven by 12 or something like that. Um, I don't want anything too big cause I don't want to be, ha- I don't want to be pulling anything too big. Um, and I just need enough room to sleep and basically, you know, eat in. Um, so I, I came across the six by 10 box trailer, uh, for really, really cheap. And, uh, I think I'm actually going to pick that up and just do some, some outfitting to it, you know, put some bunk beds in it. Um, and maybe, you know, down the line at some point, figure out a situation for some solar power, um, you know, and, and, and stuff like that to where I can have a little bit of power. I don't need it. I don't need a lot. It's not like we're spending eight to 10 hours a day in, in the thing. Um, really just need enough to be able to charge some batteries and have a little bit of light and, and, and maybe, you know, plug in a crock pot to, to, to cook some food in the evenings. Um, and that'd be about it. So, I'm I'm looking forward to this. I don't I'm I'm kind of looking forward to it and kind of not because it's just I've put you know a bunch more uh, work on my plate so to speak uh, for kind of outfitting this thing and you know, be completely honest here uh, I'm not the most proficient when it comes to um, to to building things um, that's I, I'm trying to figure out how to how to put it lightly but I, I'm not a uh, a detail person when it comes to to building things so I can promise you nothing's going to be level. And nothing will be square, but it will hold you if it needs to. Uh, so that's kind of where my where my my skills lie whenever it comes to that type of uh, that type of stuff. So looking forward to uh, to to hopefully making that happen. I'll keep you guys updated on that. And if if I do commandeer this box trailer and start doing the outfitting to it, I'm sure I'll make some videos about it and post those on on YouTube just to kind of track along my my progress. But this past weekend was uh really you know no different than the the previous weekends that we've had that 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 we've been in lockdown um again like a broken record i was back out scouting again on saturday went to a new piece i think i mentioned in the past show that i had basically gotten through all the public that i that's within i would say probably like a 30 minute drive of my house um that i've basically scouted that over the past two years um and i've hit every piece that i've wanted to hit in the areas now you know if you've heard, I guess, me talk to anybody about scouting and using maps to do that, it's, you know, I'll quickly kind of go through and lop off sections that I don't think look good from like an access perspective or whatever that I think people are going to be there, pressure or whatever. And I'll find like maybe the, if it's 3000 acres, it's like, I might find like the five or 600 acre piece of that, that I think is going to be worthwhile to spend time on. And I'll scout that. And the rest of it, I don't really pay attention to just, you know, I go off quickly and mark off what I don't think is going to work. Um, so with that, all those pieces that I've outlined as being, um, possible, you know, scenarios, you know, that I wanted to investigate, I've investigated all of those at this point. Um, and so now, you know, I'm starting to look at places that are just like outside that 30 minute ring and, and looking that, you know, what's 45 minutes to an hour outside of, outside of my kind of like 
core area and starting to investigate those. And that was my first trip um, yesterday to do so. I had hunted in this general area a few years ago. Um, actually, I think two different times in this general area. It wasn't this specific piece, but I killed a buck out there a couple years ago in this general area. And then I had a couple decent encounters one other time. Um, and so, you know, but the piece I was on yesterday, I had never been to, and I just, I kind of liked the layout of it. Um, it looked like there were some, you know, like larger clear cuts, um, you know, which, which I liked. Um, and when I got there, you know, it, it looked really good. And, and, and when I hiked in, I ended up finding a little bit of sign that was, that was decent. Um, but, you know, after I got through scouting, I guess, you know, toward the end of the day, because I didn't have a ton of time, I got a, I got a late start. And it's one of those places where I probably need to be there, like, you know, at first light and spend the whole day there. But the side I really should have spent time on, I didn't, I didn't get to, um, you know, that side of it seems to be where it's going to be a lot harder for people to get into um, than the, than the area that I was in. There was actually a food source I wanted to check out only because again, it's not that I was going to hunt the food source, but I just wanted to know what food was there and how it might come into play. So I went and checked that out. And as you would imagine, you know, Pennsylvania pressure, there were tree stands that were lined up along this guy's private property line along that, along that food source. Um, but you know, as you would imagine, as I got further and further away from it and started actually getting into the elevation part of this parcel, you know, and having to do some climbing, all of a sudden the human sign went to nothing. Um, and then I, you know, started seeing, you know, some buck sign pop up. So I saw a couple of really good rubs, um, really didn't see any scrapes <clears throat> in this, in this particular area, but there was one spot that was kind of interesting to me. It was this little patch of like pines that popped up out of nowhere. And just about every one of those was rubbed. And that's where I found the best, the best rub. So in that general area, that would maybe be where I would spend a little bit of time. It actually butts up to the edge of where the cover kind of gets really, really thick. Um, you know, and I think it's interesting this time of year that, you know, it, you start to see like what it might look like in October. Right. I think when you scout during the, you know, right during the winter, right after the season ends, like you get a good look at what it's probably going to look like in November, uh, you know, especially like mid ish to, to late November. Um, but in October, you know, whether it's the beginning or the middle of October, like you're still going to have a lot of, you know, green on the trees. And that's, you know, and this time, this time of year in spring with green up, you're probably getting a pretty fair look at what you're going to see uh, around that time of year. Um, so it was kind of interesting that there was plenty of, you know, cover in this general area that, you know, you could definitely find a buck during, during daylight. And I don't think there was a lot of pressure in that general area as you were going up the side of the side of the mountain. But my goal was really to crest the mountain, uh, cause I kind of wanted to make a big loop. And then there was a big bench on the other side of this mountain that I wanted to get to. Um, the other bummer was, is like, there's a lot of logging roads here. Cause this is logged pretty frequently. Like you can tell by just like the age of the, the clear cut go- growths that they're definitely doing a rotation through this, through this parcel. And I want to say it's probably like 3000 acres, 3,500 acres. Um, they're definitely doing a rotation through this. And so there's logging roads everywhere, but none of them are marked on the map. So it's like, as I'm scouting in, it's like I would cross a logging road once I got to the top of the mountain and, you know, which is kind of a bummer because it means people can easily walk there. Now it is a bit of a hike and I don't think, you know, everybody's going to make that hike necessarily. Um, but the side of the mountain that I really wanted to be on where I, where I saw this bench and it actually kind of bled out toward this private property line, which is in the complete back corner of this parcel. Like you'd have to walk the entire distance, um, to, to get there. And, um, it was just, it had recently, excuse me, it had recently been clear cut. I'm imagining probably this past year, maybe the year before and just like gnarly blow down everywhere to where I just didn't have enough time at the end of the day yesterday to get there check out one to what, what I wanted to check out and then get back with as much as I was going to have to try to go around, um, and get back home for, you know, an, an, uh, an event that I had with my wife last night, we had a, a date night, quarantine date night in the, in our home. So I was having to make sure I was back in time for that. So when I looked at the time and I was like, man, it's probably going to take me a little while to get there and then not enough time to kind of check out what I want to check out. And then to get back, it's like just not going to happen. So that's why I was saying I probably needed to be there all day because I probably could have covered it. So the plan is, is I think here um, in the next week or so is to, to try to get back out there and cover the other side. The cool thing is, is that that, that clear cut had just been done. And then there's one kind of in front of it when at the front of the property, when you walk in, that is just, I don't know, I want to say it's probably two, maybe three years old and everything is just like chest and like chest to neck high um, in there and just gnarly. And I did walk into that a little bit, was following a few deer trails that you could find that kind of went through and started weaving through. Um, 
which that stuff just looks awesome. And I'm looking forward to getting in there. I mean, re- realistically, I probably should have been there about a month ago. Um, but there were pieces closer to my house that I wanted to prioritize. But I think that this area could be could be really, really good. Um, and I'm hoping when I get on the other side of the mountain that I find the the sign that I was that, that, that I'm expecting, which is, you know, it's hard to get to. It's gnarly as shit. People aren't going to walk into it. There's a decent ag food sources that the food source that's there. There's a ton of uh, white oaks that I've that I've seen on this property just in the part that I was scouting. So there's plenty of acorns. There's tons of browse everywhere. So they won't want for food. And I think that spot, if I were to guess, like I think you could probably get some age on a deer in there and let it reach its uh, genetic potential. Um, just by the way, just by how thick it is and how hard it is to get into. And then on the other side of the road, there's another huge clear cut that I want to check out. So I think there's a handful of good spots in here that I could spend some time on, um, and have some pretty good, have some pretty good action, but, uh, we'll see what I find the rest of this, you know, the rest of the spring and into, into summer. Um, it may not even be a spot that I hit this year. It might just be a spot that I hang some cameras and let them sit and, and then maybe, you know, um, pick apart next, uh, next winter. And maybe put into the rotation for the following year. But so with that, we're going to jump into today's podcast with my buddy Brian Broderick and talk more specifically about uh, what his business is known for: Day Six Specialized Gear, which is known for uh, killer broadheads and killer arrows. We're going to really kind of discuss the whole idea of, of of heavy arrows. It's very you know hot topic, very much a hot topic right now. Very trendy. A lot of discussion online about it. How heavy you know are are the arrows you're shooting or shooting a you know quote unquote adult arrows, if you will. Um, but you know, for me, I wanted to understand like how heavy should my arrow be? How do you determine what is the right weight for your arrow? How meticulous do you need to be when you're building your arrows? You know, I like to build my own arrows, but I'll be the first to tell you, I have a lot to learn when it comes to arrow performance, bow performance, et cetera. And Brian does a great job of breaking it down, uh, breaking down the things you need to be, uh, you need to consider when you're, when you're building arrows, um, the, the weight that's going to be, you know, uh, potentially correct for you and the factors you need to need to consider in relationship to that. And then also how meticulous do you need to be to get a high performing arrow and a great foundation, um, for a hunting application? Cause I think a lot of times, you know, we're tweaking things to the point of thinking that we're, uh, Levi Morgan when we're just, when that's just not the case. Uh, and, and the reality is, is that you're never going to tell the difference of that, you know, three grains, you know, difference between your arrows or whatever that we might, painstakingly kind of, uh, uh, pour over some guys maybe just like to be that meticulous, but that's just not me. And I wanted to know that if that's not the case, you know, am I still going to have an arrow that's going to perform optimally for me in a hunting scenario? So with that, we're going to go ahead and dive into this conversation in progress. And as always, thank you all for listening, but uh, I, I want to change gears here, man. I want to talk a little bit about, um, about arrow setups and so forth. Cause this, you know, this time of year, you know, people are of course spending a lot of time scouting, like we've talked about, but also they're spending time kind of looking at their gear, reevaluating, kind of figuring out what their setups are going to be They're Maybe they're changing bows. If they're changing bows are likely looking at, you know, different arrow setups and stuff like that. And so one of the things, you know, I think for me that I want to get better at, um, that, you know, I I build my own arrows, you know, building my, my own day six arrows and so forth. But I, I know some guys that take it to the next level and they're really paying attention to how they're kind of putting components together with the arrow and weighing everything out to make sure that they're having like as much consistency as possible between all their, between all their arrows. And I will admittedly say that I haven't gotten to that point yet. And that's something I'm looking to be better at. So I wanted to just talk to you, you know, an, an, an expert and say, you know, if you're building an arrow, you know, I would like for you just to kind of walk me through like what your steps are to building that arrow to try to get as much consistency as possible. Um, you know, regardless of whether it's your, you know, practice arrows or your, or your hunting arrows. So what, what's that process look like for you? Well, um, I'm going to be super honest. Uh, I always try to be super honest. Um, so I can help guys, uh, instead of just following industry trends or whatever the popular, you know, trick of the week is, um, mm-hmm. weight sorting arrows, weight sorting components. You don't need to do that. Um, unless you have a, a you know, a hooter shooter shooting machine, um, set up in your stand, you're not going to notice 10 grains of difference. Right. <laughs> so, the human can't shoot that. Um, 
and and that's not just for me that's some from one of the best shooters in the world so or if not the best shooter in the world so don't get too caught up on, in that mm-hmm. um so you know if, if you want to do it for fun a lot of guys do it just because they like uh the detail they like the process that's okay um and i would say that if you're going to do that kind of stuff, the benefit of that is not going to be in your shooting with regards to weight matching, but it is going to be beneficial just so you're a little bit more invested in your setup and your gear. And it's helping you understand, um, you know, your, your equipment a little better. So I think that's where the benefit is of doing it. And so what you can do is, you know, weigh your arrows and, um, you know, just organize them lightest to heaviest, left to right, and then weigh your components and um, organize those um, in the reverse, left to right. And so you match your heaviest component with your lightest uh, shaft. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, you're just basically, you know, um, blending the highs and lows together to get a more consistent you know, average weight, uh, our arrows, um, we try to send them out within two or three grains of an entire dozen on the shafts and our components, um, there won't be more than a grain, um, Delta between 12. So, uh, you're really just cutting hairs at that point. Right. Um, but with our stuff, if you wanted to do it and wanted to make that investment, you can easily get, you know, uh, the plus or minus over a dozen arrows at about two grains. Right. Um, if you got it within 10 grains, you're good. So don't, don't stress. <laughs> right. I know that's not the popular thing to say, but, uh, it, you don't need to do all that crap. So what's super important is, um, the, the reason that you buy a, a, a higher end arrow is really for nothing more than spine consistency. Um, I really don't care how straight it is. Um, you know, the industry uh, has convinced um, uh, the, the, the consumer that, you know, the 1,000 straightness arrows are a necessity. They're not. Um, but we spec out 1000 straightness for different reasons. Uh, number one, if we spec out 1000 straightness arrows, that means that 80% of what we end up getting is 1%. We'll still have 20% that are, you know, 3000 straightness. Mm-hmm. Um, but what the consumer needs to understand about the arrow industry is that when, when an arrow is, let's say that it's passed at that that 1000 straightness tolerance. It's not just the straightness that they're testing. They're also testing the spine to make sure that it's consistent. Okay. So if it's supposed to be a 300 spine arrow, you know, they've got their variance there. And, and if it meets that, that's what you get. When you buy the cheaper arrows that are the you know, cheaper three thousandths and the cheaper six thousandths. And I'm not talking about higher end arrows that are three thousand straightness. I'm talking about the, the cheaper ones. What you're basically buying is all of the culls off of a production run. Mm-hmm. So when an arrow manufacturer makes a hundred thousand arrows um, and they have 50,000 that meet one thousandths straightness, and then they also are proper and within the proper range of the spine um they don't throw the other fifty thousand away right they just create another line so you may have an arrow you know you may get a dozen arrows that are say six thousand straightness and you test them you're like dang these are not that bad Mm -hmm. but you may if they're three a dozen three hundred shafts you may have you know a range from 260 to 340 and the spine is what gives you accuracy, and that's what gives you consistency with your shooting. Um, you want them all to be 
within, you know, five or ten thousandths of 300, 300 spot. That's where your accuracy comes from. Um, and so when you buy these cheaper arrows with the, the they're using the, the straightness as basically the indicator of what they are. It's not just that. Right. So and just 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 to touch on real quick um, and we'll get into building arrows. What I'm saying, uh, a cheaper arrow, and a more expensive arrow, we've been tagged as an expensive arrow, but we're actually not. Um, if you look at what a lot of the high end popular arrows are out there, they're, you know, 140 to 150 dollars a dozen um, where ours are 170. Um, but all of those arrows you buy, they come with just a little, you know, five cent aluminum or brass insert right. uh, and then you have to go buy like collars or footers or whatever type of system you want to build a very durable arrow to where ours come with standard you know the centric system which what I, I honestly feel like our outsert system is the best overall system for a, a small diameter arrow um but ours come with that. And if you went and priced having to buy a dozen outserts with a average price dozen shafts, ours are way cheaper. Right. Uh, so you're basically getting, you know, what you would have to cobble together from multiple companies all in one shot for a lot less money, you know? Right. Um, so I just want to put that out there because I'm not sure how we've gotten deemed as expensive uh, but I think it's just probably a lack of exposure to building super durable arrows using aftermarket components, you know? Right. And that, and the other thing I like too, is that, you know, that they're, um, especially for me, who's an, a novice builder, um, those components are going to work with that yes. arrow, you know what I mean? So I'm not having to worry about, well, which, which company is going to match with this arrow and, and so on and so it takes the guesswork out for me. And to go back to what you were saying about the variance in, in grains, like, you know, building from left to right and that that's not necessarily Im- important. It's it, if, if you're into it, that's great, but it's, it's not required in order to have a really good arrow set up. <clears throat> I don't match mine as I had mentioned. And just for, you know, uh, fun last night, I, I weighed my arrows just to kind of see like what my variance was. I literally, I was at less than a two grain variance across six arrows without matching anything without matching, you know, component with arrow based on weight. You just glued the components on. Yep. Just, I, yeah. gra- I grabbed them out of the bag. I put them together, glued the components on, glued the, my fletchings on and, and called it a day. Yeah. Well, you know, we do, we basically do that for you. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to get something that's going to get, you know, that span. Um, and, I, and I would say guys could go out and weigh their arrow systems right now after listening to this. And they're probably going to see a, you know, 10 grain to, you know, plus or minus, you know, uh, Delta between a dozen on, on most brands. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it. You're not going to, you're not going to miss a deer because of it. You're not going to be less accurate. What you want to be concerned with is that it is a quality shaft and it is a number one shaft. Uh, and the spines are all very close to each other. Right. Because if the arrow is flexing differently coming off the bow, it's never going to hit in the same place. Um, you basically, if you think about it, um, if you think about like listening to music, okay, and there's a constant bass line beat that's the same, all right? And so that beat is the same all the way through, never changes. The way an arrow flexes is the same. It's flexing back and forth. Mm -hmm. And what you want is you want every arrow coming off that bow following that same beat. Does that make sense? Yep. Totally makes sense. Yeah. So if it's doing that, that means when it gets to this distance away from the bow, the, the knock is flexing left at the same place with every arrow every time. So let's say 20 feet in front of the bow. It's flexing left a half an inch. Um, You want all the arrows to be at that same point, 20 feet in front of the bow. So you're basically um, uh, trying to match that rhythm. 
And the only way to do that is to have the spine identical. Mm -hmm. So if it's different, the beat's going to change as that arrow is coming away from the bow. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. Cause at 20 feet, whenever you're saying, you know, you want to be an inch left, let's say with your knock at 20 feet, your next arrow, if it's not spined correctly, could be an inch right at 20 feet That's or right. an inch down at 20 feet. And so now basically you have a band that is playing, they are all playing a different song. They are. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and if it's weaker now, instead of being, a half inch left at 20 feet, it may be a full inch. And then if it's stiffer, it may be a half inch to the right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you took a piece of paper and you could shoot your arrow and then have the knock draw a line, it would just basically be this little consistent squiggly line that starts wide. And then the squiggles get tighter together the farther away it gets from um, the bow. So it basically would look like a, a snake that would be going through the sand and he would start out with a real wide path and it would just get narrower and narrower like a cone. You basically would want to shoot every arrow and have that knock trace the same line. Um, and that's what's super important with building arrows. Right. And really the only way that the listener is going to do this is just to buy a quality arrow shaft. Right. Um, right. The, the, and you want to buy if you're, if you're really, if you're really into it and you want to shoot a bigger broadhead and you want to shoot, cause you want your broadheads to shoot very, very closely to your field tips. Um, uh, that's what needs to happen. There's really not anything else you can do, um, with regards to the arrow, uh, to accomplish that. So when guys can't get their broadheads to fly, um, Either they have inconsistent spine uh, or their bow is basically not tuned. And nine times out of ten, it's that the center shot is off. Right. And that's, that's actually one, that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you is because, yeah. you know, do you yourself, like, do you, you know, do broadhead tuning? Do you tune your bows with broadheads versus your field points? Because I know, you know, like my, I know, you know, my buddy, Greg Litzinger, I believe he shoots day yeah. six arrows as well. And he, he does my bow setups for me and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, in talking to him, you know, he might have to tune a little bit. Um, but what he's, what, what he's basically said, you know, or has, has told me is like, look, if you have a well-tuned bow, it should shoot a broadhead when you put it on it. It shouldn't be that big of a difference. He's like, if there is a big difference, he's like, you likely have a bow that's not well-tuned or you have arrows that aren't, that aren't spying correctly. Right. That's exactly right. So, um, if you're, if you have a properly spined arrow, uh, and your bow is tuned, you could strap a damn tennis racket on the front of that son of a bitch and shoot it. <laughs> um, I'm hoping we get Instagram videos of people doing this. Yeah. So, um, there's, you know, if it's not grouping broadheads, it's not the broadhead. Okay. Right. Um, and I don't give a crap whose broadhead it is. It, that's not what it is. Um, so basically, if you get the right spine arrow, um, and, and, and basically there's two things. There's static spine, which that means it's just, you know, a full length 300 shaft is a 300 spine when it's sitting on the table. Okay. And then you have dynamic spine. And the dynamic spine is, is when you go to hacking on this arrow and cutting it down, adding weight so on and so forth, adjusting length, adding weight, you're changing the dynamic spine and that's how it's reacting under load from the bow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're looking at is once you get that dynamic spine set, right, which it's tough for most guys to figure that out. That's why it's just so easy to pick up the phone and call somebody like me and say 72 pound, you know, Matthews VXR 29 inch draw. I'd love to shoot 150 grain head. What do I need? Mm -hmm. Well, guys that set up arrows and bows, you know, dozens a day know that they kind of know what your spine dynamic spine changes are going to be when you're adding, say that 150 grains. And so instead of recommending, well, I should have a 29 inch draw and it'll shoot a 29 inch arrow. You know, I'm going to say, hey, well, if you're going to add that extra weight, we're going to do one of two things. We're going to shorten the shaft to offset the extra weight up front to 
change the dynamic spine, or we're going to add a little weight to the back, which will offset, you know, the, um, the dynamic spine. Um, it'll help stiffen it up too. So you can, uh, the, the arrow length is the easiest way to adjust the spine. So when guys send me a message or call me and say, Hey, I shoot 70 pounds and I have a 27 inch arrow. You know, my thing is, is not yet. You don't <laughs> right. tell me what your draw length is. Tell me what point weight is. And then we're going to decide what your arrow length is going to be. Right. Because if it means shooting a 28 and a half inch arrow, but you're going to get perfect matching dynamic spine and it's going to fly perfect. Mm-hmm. That's what you want. Right. You don't care what your draw length is in relationship to what your arrow length is. The only thing you can't do is make it shorter than what your rest is. <laughs> right. 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 So, yeah. so, so, so can we, can we use so, me as an example? Cause I'm always curious with my setup, like what my arrow length should be. Can we, can we do that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I'm shooting, uh, I think, uh, 71 pounds. Yep. Um, draw length is 26 and a half. I have short Tyrannosaurus Rex arms. Yeah. Can't um, reach what, what'd you say? Can't reach your pockets. No, can't reach my pockets. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then right now I'm shooting a hundred, hundred gram broadhead. Okay. With and a your, 50 grain outsert or a hundred grain outsert, 50 grain outsert. And then the, uh, the insert. Yeah. So you're, you're one of those guys that's right on the line. So you could shoot a, um, longer 300 or a shorter 350. Okay. So you can basically, you know, basically like, if you had a, a spine arrow for every, for every person, you know, your perfect arrow would be like a 325. Does right. that sound right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're either going to shorten, you know, a 350 to get there, or you're going to lengthen a 300 and add weight to get there. Yeah. So like if, if you were going to shoot 300s, you know, you'd probably want to shoot a 28, 28 and a half inch arrow. If you're shooting 350s, you're probably going to want to shoot a, you know, 26 inch arrow, hmm. um, with, with those broadhead weights and, and all of that. So that's, I guess what I would, would recommend now. I, I don't know what you built your arrows to, uh, lengthwise. Uh, I can't, I can't remember, but that's what I would kind of recommend. Yeah. I'm shooting, th- uh, 350 spines and I'm just a little under 27 inches, like probably 26 and three quarters. Yeah. Well, you're fine. Yeah. So, um, you're, you're never going to be able to shoot to a level to where you're going to see, um, a, a half inch difference, like right. a half inch. is not going to tell you a difference. That's the kind of you know, Levi Morgan. Those guys can see that difference. Right. Um, us normal humans, we, we can't see that. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. So 26 inches, 27 inches, what you've got, you're, you're ready to eat. So you, you've got exactly what you need. Nice. Um, I would tell you that, um, you know, if it were me, uh, and I was drawing some, you know, drawing that short of a draw length, you know, uh, and not generating the energy, you know, at 71 pounds, my bow is at about 71, 72, but mine is at 28 and a half and we could shoot the same arrow and mine would be, you know, 10, 15 feet per second faster mm-hmm. because, you know, bows are designed to perform at 30 yeah. and which again is a total injustice to, um, the, the, the bow hunting industry or bow hunting consumer because they're designed to, to perform at optimum efficiency at 30 because that's how they can get the most speed for advertising. Right. Um, bows should be designed to be optimum at 28 because that's the average draw. Right. Um, but it's not so, uh, so, but what I would say is, is if, if I were you, you know, I would be building a, a heavier arrow than that. Uh, I would be building a, an arrow that would be, you know, 500 grains to, you know, 540, somewhere in that range. Right. And I did in, in weighing, weighing them last night, I actually, they weighed, uh, 470 grains is where I'm at right yeah. now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say 475, but uh, yeah. yeah, so that's about, yeah, 470. So, you know, what I would say is, is I, I would rather give up, you know, 10 feet per second and have a little heavier arrow. Right. Um, 
And by doing that, by having a heavier arrow, the other thing that you can do is shoot a larger um, surface area broadhead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but let's back up a second. We glazed, we glossed over, skipped over why guys are not getting good broadhead flight yeah. uh, by tuning. Um, you want to go back to that? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to that. Yeah. Okay. So most of the time, if it's not the shooter, which a lot of times it is the shooter with grip torque and all that kind of stuff, the grip hand is the, is the devil for bow hunters. Yeah. Um, but if it's not that someone's got really good form, but they're, they're, um, still not getting good broadhead flight. It's normally that their center shot is off. And basically what it is, is, um, the, the string is traveling, um, uh, if you can imagine the string travel is like a plane of glass and you want, when that string goes forward is, you know, it's going forward in a sheet, like a plane of glass. And you want that arrow going straight forward, straight down the plane of glass, right? Mm -hmm. If your rest is to the left or the right of that path, you're never going to get good flight. Okay. Because what happens is, is that the string is not going to change the direction it's going. It's going to go straight. But if the arrow rest is not in perfect alignment with that, it's pushing the arrow, if you will. Um, it's, it's, it's pushing the arrow to the left or the right of that plane of glass, and it's forcing it. It's forcing the arrow in a direction it doesn't want to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what happens is, is as soon as that arrow leaves the bow, the string is going, you know, say the string's going to 12 o'clock, but the rest is causing the, the, the arrow to go to 11. So as soon as it goes out, what's happening is, is that the, the, the arrow is kicking left because it's getting pushed the other way and it's getting pushed by the knock the other way. So the head's going forward and then the, the, the knock is getting pushed to the left of that and it comes out at an angle and then the, uh, the fletchings basically have to correct it and steer it and get it, get it straight again. Does that make sense? Yep. So what happens is, is that remember we talked about that squiggly line, you know, and it getting smaller and smaller the farther away the arrow gets away from the boat. Well, if the rest is not in perfect alignment with the string travel, as soon as it comes off the bow, that squiggly line is way wider than it should be. It's fish tailing and trying to recover itself. OK, mm -hmm. so the, the fletchings are having to basically steer, you know, that 500 grain arrow. So. If you can get your center shot true, which it doesn't always mean that the arrow is pointing straight out from the bow. Hmm. Like if you look down at your arrow and you've got your stabilizer sticking out and your arrow is in perfect parallel alignment with the stabilizer, that doesn't always mean that it's in true center shot travel. It means that it's in the center of the riser. Right. But the riser, the limbs, the cams, the strings and harnesses may not be in concert together to where that is the true center and the true path of travel, string travel. So you may have to move that rest left or right a little bit, just the shade. I'm not talking about much. And that arrow may not be in perfect alignment. Now, if you want the arrow in perfect alignment, you can always shim cams. And that's what Greg's good at sliding cams left or right, yeah. twisting harnesses, leaning cams, which is bringing the string left or right. It's what you're doing, trying to get it in true center shot. But it doesn't really matter um, as long as the rest is in perfect alignment with the string travel. So once you get that done, if you can shoot your bare shafts in the same hole with your fletched arrows, the only thing that's telling you is, is that the fletchings are not doing anything. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the arrow shaft is able to get there in a straight line flying true on its own. It doesn't need the help of the veins. Right. So if you have it perfectly bare shaft tuned, 
Now your veins are just along for the ride. Okay. So now their only job is to offset the surface area that you're going to add on the front of the arrow with the broadhead. Okay. Hmm. So you add that, you're adding wings to the front and it's going to have its own ideas on what it's going to do. And so you've got that little broadhead up there, but now you've got, you know, four times the surface area in the back that's creating, you know, creating your rotation um, and steering that head. So it's not having to steer the, the shaft anymore. It's only steering the head. It's only offsetting for that. And so now your veins have an easy job. It's like four guys beating up one guy. Right. You know, we got you. Um, and that's that, that's what, you know, makes where you can shoot a bigger broadhead as you want. So and then the arrow mass helps with that, too, because if you're shooting a super light arrow, super fast, you've got the wind forcing harder on that break broadhead blade on the front, which is making it more volatile. Uh, and then if the arrow is light, it's easy for that to manipulate the arrow, but if the arrow is heavier, it's more stable. It's, it's basically, you know, anybody that grew up like I did and, you know, rode in the back of your grandparents old, you know, old 88 or yep. crown Victoria or, or whatever, um, you know, your granddad would get on the interstate and go 90 and you just, you were just floating along, you know, mm -hmm. well, you get in a sports car and do that and you just barely touch the wheel and it's, you know, it's juking around. Same thing with a motorcycle or anything. The faster you go, the more volatile it gets. The heavier, more stable arrow is going to allow you to shoot a bigger broadhead. It's going to allow you to be more accurate. It's basically going to help mask the form, the form issues you have, torque grip and all those things. It's way more forgiving. So people have gotten so caught up in speed and there's very few humans out there that can actually shoot a high performance light arrow at high speeds and shoot it accurately. Right. I mean, it has to be one of the pros. Right. Um, but for us as hunters, you know, that's not what we're looking for. We want to be extremely accurate. We want the arrow flying true. Um, we want to be able to shoot a big broadhead. And for us to do that, we've got to slow it down and increase the mass. Right. It's just it's simple physics. It's nothing, you know, this isn't rocket science or anything. It's just common sense stuff. Right. But, what? The, but the market has done us an incredible injustice by telling us that the alternative to that which is the light arrows and high speed is what you want. Right. And that's just, that's just how they sell bows. They sell it based on speed. Yeah. And the one thing, the way Greg kind of explained it to me, cause I know, and I want to talk about heavy arrows here because that's become, you know, a very hot, hot topic. And I, you and I, when I first met you, however long ago, you know, I know you were talking about heavy arrows before it became the in vogue thing to talk about. And the way, you know, Greg, you know, keep referencing our, our mutual friend, but he shoots a lot of competition. And he shoots a specific arrow set up that are his competition arrows and he has specific, you know, hunting arrow setups and his competition arrows are super, super light. And the way yeah. he, you know, and this is, I didn't know anything about competition shooting at all until I started, you know, shooting with him recreationally, of course. And, you know, basically what he said was, he was like, look, I sh you shoot lighter arrows and this is probably common knowledge for some people, but it wasn't for me. And I'm assuming there's probably people out there that don't know this, but he was saying, for him, he's like competition arrows. He's like, or lighter. He's like, because I want that arrow to spend the least amount of time in the air as possible because he's like, the longer it spends time in the air, the more likely it ha has an opportunity to be impacted by variables outside of my control. So wind or whatever the case is, he's like, so I want that thing to get there. And he's also shooting bigger round arrows because you want to take up more target space to try to get more exits. Right. You know, and so for him, he was like hunting setup. He's like, I want a heavier arrow. He's like, because it's going to be, I'm not going to be standing on flat ground. I'm going to be in a tree. There's going to be wind. The tree's going to be swaying. You know, I'm not always going to have the perfect, perfect angle. He's like, so my arrow has to absorb some of the imperfections I'm going to have in that environment. And that was kind of the way he explained the difference to me between shooting a light arrow for hunting versus shooting a heavier arrow for hunting. That's right. It's, it's just way more forgiving. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you've got the mass factor. So, 
you know, with regards to um, penetration, you know, you're you're trying to create a um, uh, you're trying to create a a, a higher momentum um, uh, a higher momentum calculation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the reason is, is that kinetic energy is for bullets. It's not for arrows. Um, uh, you know, the, the, um, I'm trying to think of an easy way to, uh, to say this, but basically it's, it's, um, it's, it's the difference in somebody kicking you in the face with a soccer ball or throwing a bowling ball at you. You'll take the soccer ball. every day. <laughs> right. You know, it may sting a little bit, you know, cause it's going fast, but it doesn't have any momentum behind it. Um, um, so, um, it doesn't have the in, knockdown I, power. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the, the problem is, is that, that everyone has been basically told that um, that you want that faster arrow because you want a flatter trajectory. Mm-hmm. Well, that would be great if you didn't have sights. Um, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But if you've got sights, it doesn't really matter. And and just to prove that point, you know, with a with a compound bow for the last. 25 years i've shot one pin Mm -hmm. um and it's not a movable pin it is one pin one fixed sight um and so uh, um for 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 me it is one of those things that um i'm never going to shoot far so out past that 40 range it doesn't matter to me mm-hmm. but I have all these guys that say well i do shoot long distance and that's their choice i need that lighter arrow well they're contradicting themselves there too because it's the that's going to be uh akin to throwing a ping pong ball versus throwing a golf ball right so if you shoot a light fast arrow and then a slower heavier arrow at some point the light fast arrow is going to be shedding velocity at a higher rate than the heavier mass arrow. The heavier mass area, once it gets moving, it retains its velocity a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Um, So for instance, say you shot your arrow at 280 and I shot a 600 grain arrow at 250. At some point out there, say zero to a hundred, our impact point is going to be exactly the same. Let's say it's fifty yards. Okay, mm-hmm. so let's say you you uh, sight the bow in at, at ten yards, both arrows, and then you just start shooting it at dots farther, 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 and you're measuring the drop. We'll say zero to fifty. Your drop is going to be less, but when we get to fifty, the impact point will be the same. Right. Then when we go to 60, the lighter arrow is going to be lower because it's shedding velocity now. And the heavier arrow is maintaining that speed and trajectory. And it's going to have an overall flatter trajectory. Right. And people have started to play with that uh, and, and see it for themselves in their backyard. Right. Uh, it, it's not that big of a trajectory difference um, when you lose 20 feet per second. Uh, but what you do have is, is you have the benefit of mass now right. and that mass, if it's flying true, is what's going to help you stick the arrow in the other side of the animal in the ground, right. uh, stick it to the ground, the other side of the animal, which is what the goal is here. Um, the other thing is, is that that, like we talked about earlier, that heavier setup is going to be so much more forgiving for you in true hunting situations and man, that's where everybody shits the bed. Mm-hmm. It's not getting a shot. It's closing the deal. Right. And th- that's it. And, you know, the guys that consistently close the deal every year, they have a very simple fail safe, nothing fancy, just super heavy arrow setup. you know, that's super simple. 
a good weight. It's flying slow but true. And when I say slow, it's slower but not slow. Right. Um, and they just don't fail. And when they hit the animal, uh, and the animal's spinning, turning, whatever, the arrow still penetrates into that thoracic cavity. That that that's that's the difference. I mean, it's not getting the shot; it's closing the deal. And you're not going to close the deal consistency if you're following what the bow hunting industry has told you is the way to go. Right. Yeah. I.e., fast bows, light arrows, expandable broadheads. Right. You know, that's all a recipe for very inconsistent success. Right. I mean, I know for me, whenever I started shooting heavier arrows, it immediately it did a couple things. One, it actually deadened my bow as far as like the, the, the sound of the bow. Um, which, you know, was just, an, I didn't realize that that would happen. And it was just a nice, happy kind of unintended consequence. Um, and then just the power down range was, was ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like whenever the difference between the lighter arrows that I was hitting, whenever I was hitting a target, just, I'm just talking purely target shooting at this point, just the sound of it hitting was different. And I didn't, in all honesty, it's like, I didn't lose a ton of, a ton of speed necessarily. Nothing. I mean, it wasn't necessarily noticeable. You know, it's like, I'm sure it slowed down a little bit, but what I was getting down range and then proved out in shooting deer was worth the, worth the trade off. And to your point, it's like, I, I'm personally not shooting anything like you more, over 40 yards. I use one pin that doesn't move. I have it set at 25 yards. That's it. You know, um, out West, I might shoot a little further. So let me ask you this. Do you use the same setup, whether you're hunting, you know, whitetails or if you're going out West to hunt bigger game, are you using the same setup or do you, do you slightly change it up a little bit? No, I shoot the same arrow for everything. Okay. So uh, this year I shot um, uh, an elk, a mule deer, uh, five whitetail bucks, um, and six whitetail does with the same arrow. I'm not talking about the same setup. I'm talking about the same arrow. Yeah. So I shot all 13 of those animals with the, the exact same arrow and same broadhead. I resharpened the broadhead, of course, but, right. um, but no, I shoot the same arrow for everything. So this is what's funny to me is people say, this is what I hear 10 times a day. Well, I'm only hunting white tails, so this is all I need. And, you know, just by the function of where I live <laughs> um, and how I've grown up here, I've had the opportunity to shoot a lot of whitetails. And so I would say that, that having a, a, a stable, perfectly flying arrow with a lot of mass is more important on whitetails than it is on elk. Really? Absolutely. Um, because whitetails nine times out of 10 are in movement and they're in a lot of movement when the arrow gets there. Uh, they're dropping, ducking, spinning, especially ours. Mm -hmm. Um, and when your arrow hits a moving target, uh, that is where the mass really comes into play because what happens is, is as soon as the arrow starts to enter the deer, the air and the deer is moving. It's immediately pulling the head out of the path of the arrow flight. Okay. So now instead of having it, the knock driving straight behind the head and putting all say 500 grains behind the head, when you hit a moving deer, as soon as the arrow gets in there, the head's going right, but the knock's still trying to travel straight. Mm -hmm. So for, for every, little bit that that deer moves it's reducing your overall mass by what's behind the head okay so let's just say that as soon as the arrow hits and it goes in an inch and the deer has moved and spun two inches well you're you're the value you know the mass value of your 500 grain arrow is now like 250 because the knocks over to the left and the head's over to the right and it's not pushing everything through um, it's the difference in, um, did you ever, have you ever boxed? That's, no, a, that's another thing nobody does anymore is box. I grew up boxing. So. Right. No, I have, but I've been punched in the face. So I'm familiar. Right. So <laughs> if you stand there 
and close your eyes and don't know that it's coming um, and uh, and get punched in the face, you know, you're going to get put on your ass. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're boxing and you got your eyes open and you see that you're about to get hit, you can turn away, back and away with the direction of the punch and reduce the effects of that blow. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. You're absorbing, you're absorbing the energy versus. Yeah. Versus. Well, you're, well, you're, yeah. You're lessening it. Yeah. You know, versus so it becomes eating. a glancing blow versus a flush blow to the noggin. So, right. Um, so that's, that's the same thing when you're shooting whitetails, those jokers are always dropping, spinning, turning, and the mass is the only thing that's going to save you because arrow flight is the number one key to penetration. If you have perfect arrow flight and the knock is directly behind the head, you're getting the value of 100% of that mass and velocity, which is momentum uh, of that arrow. If you're not getting good arrow flight and the knock is wobbling or it's flying at an angle, it's not behind the head. You're only getting a percentage of that mass value. So arrow flight is key. Arrow flight's number one, but arrow flight can't save you if the target is moving mm. and it's and it's absor- it's absorbing that energy and it's deflecting it into a different direction. The only thing that can save you at that point is mass, right? Because the higher your original mass number starts, the higher each percentage is as that as that mass number decreases because of the head not being, you know, being pushed it forward by the knock. Right. So if you shoot a 600 grain arrow and you hit a deer and he moves and you lose 50% of your mass value, you're still shooting a 300 grain arrow. You're still getting 300 grains. If you shoot a 400 grain arrow, you're down to 200 grains. Right. Big difference. Yep. So that's why it's better to start with a higher, weight overall mass arrow especially on whitetails and then on elk it's basically a function of shooting them through the shoulder shooting them in the chest that kind of stuff um they're going to move a little but they're not going to move like a whitetail is and not at the rate now elk do move i've seen them completely you know uh completely spin out of the way of an arrow at long shots i mean it's they're incredible what they can do but that zero to 30 range, which is the average shot. You're not going to get the movement out of that elk like you are with a, with a white tail. The other thing is, is that the white tails vitals are, you know, 20% of what an elk's vitals are. Yeah. So there's not a lot of room for error with a white tail, especially when they're spinning like the matrix, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot better, a lot better chance of you catching shoulder on a white tail than there should be with an elk just because you have a, larger mass area behind that shoulder to play with a lot of larger mass of, of, of kill area behind that shoulder. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, for whitetails it's, it's, it's challenging, right? Because you have a small area. You're really a lot of times trying to tuck that arrow behind that shoulder. You know what I mean? And an inch left, you know, if, if, if if it's moving from right to left, you know what I mean? That that could be shoulder blade. Or if you have one that's quartering toward you a little bit and you got to try to slip it in behind that shoulder, it's like you might catch some shoulder blade on the way through. And, uh, you know, with an elk, it's like you just have a little bit more area to area to play with, a little bit more margin for error. But uh, That's right. Are there any uh, – do you make any different considerations for, you know, when you're – you know, because I know you shoot traditional archery as well. Um, do you make any different considerations for your arrow set up for your traditional equipment versus your compound? I do. I, I go even heavier. Hmm. Um because, you know, I basically treat a traditional bow the same way I would treat um, a youth or a, you know, female, low pounded, short draw shooter on a compound. And I'm just saying that so people can, you know, have a frame of reference there. Um, you know, it's uh, you don't have the 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 speed side of the momentum equation you don't have the velocity side like you would with a you know 70 pound bow drawing 29 30 inches so you have a a a lot lower um velocity calculation so the only way to get your momentum up is to beef up the mass side make sense yep yep 
So when I'm setting up my trad bows, I'm not as concerned with speed as I am with mass. Um, and, and basically, you know, what led me to, you know, day six and these arrows and this system is trying to, to pick up a five or 10% advantage with every single component that I could on my trad bows, because you have to maximize efficiency uh, with a trad bow to get good penetration. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of things working against you. Uh, You have a high possibility of a bad release, you know, torque in the string, whatever, Um, uh, you know, face deflection, torque, hand torque, you know, all of those things on a trad bow are just magnified. So you've got to be able to build a, uh, a super stable, super uh, efficient uh, arrow to get the best flight you can get the fastest. So with a trad bow, uh, you know, a lot of people say, I'm never going to shoot over 15 yards, which says it's great. But in all honestly, all honesty with a trad bow, the farther you get away from the bow, the more efficient the arrow flight is because it's recovering right. from all the crap you've induced on it, you know? Right. So by shooting a slower, heavier arrow with a lot of mass, it's super stable. You can get that arrow to recover very quickly as it leaves the bow. Um, so you can get good penetration at close ranges. The, 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 the honest truth is, is that most people can't accurately shoot a trad bow over 20. There's a very small percentage of people that do. Um, now, there's a lot of guys out there that say they can. They can't. Right. Um, <laughs> so that's there's a, a lot of guys that, that say they can on and, and, and do it pretty well on targets. But it's a different game when it's an animal and there's not an orange dot to shoot at. Right. And there's not a, uh, you know, a reference for your the point of your arrow. Um, so accuracy in the field and accuracy on the range with a trad bow is two different things. So what I'm trying to do is, is I'm trying to set up a super heavy, uh, super efficient system, uh, that is going to recover very quickly, obtain and achieve the best arrow flight as fast as I can. And as closest to the closest point to the front of that bow as I can. So, you know, at five yards, I want that thing to be super efficient at 10 yards. I want it perfect. And the only way to do that is to just micro tune. Mm -hmm. Now you're still going to have crazy variables with a trad bow. So that's why it's important to try to pick up those little percentages. Okay. So broadhead design, broadhead geometry, blade sharpness. We're just starting at the front of the air. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to get, uh, uh, you want that broadhead to have the least amount of resistance by its geometry or its shape um, as possible. And you want it to stay as sharp as you can possibly get it um, and stay as sharp as possible the longest, because that's what causes hemorrhage, allows it to have great penetration. Sharpness is so key on penetration uh, because it's reducing resistance. Yep as is the geometry of that head. So you want uh, a very low profile, little resistance, very slight blade angle. So it's not causing resistance as it's going through the animal and engaging hair, hide, meat, bone, sinew, whatever. But the other thing that that low profile, low blade angle does is it maintains the edge longer. So an ax dulls very quickly a knife that you drag and slice stays sharp very long. Hmm. You know, you don't take your knife when you're skinning and push it straight down. You draw it and you drag it and you want the geometry of your blade to mimic that. It takes very little resistance to draw a blade and cut versus having to push and chop like an ax. Hmm. So all of these heads that start out narrow and then flare at the back, you're basically putting an ax or a cleaver at the back. So you're putting something that's creating a lot of drag. And then the other thing that it does where these heads that flare out at the back 
is that drag also dulls that blade because it's basically flying at a perpendicular angle to the travel. It's like an axe. It's dulling very quickly. It's not slicing, it's chopping. Right. So you're killing your percentage of uh, efficiency by the geometry there, and you're dulling your blade, which the sharpness is the key factor as well. So that's why the geometry of a head is so important. Um, as you move back from that, uh, the benefit of having an outsert or a collar that is slightly larger than the body of the shaft, I, I don't know that anybody's quantified it, but it is, it's incredible. And any aero manufacturer will tell you this. This is not any secret. If the widest point of your arrow is at the very front of the outsert, and then it gets smaller behind that. Um, that is the key to penetration. Now, I'm not a tapered arrow fan, and there, I don't even want to dive into that. There's so many issues with that. Um, I don't even want to dive into it. Mm -hmm. But having a, say, standard diameter outsert, and then as soon as you get past the front, it is immediately dropping away to a micro diameter, and you've got that 30% smaller diameter arrow behind that one point. Once that goes through that one tiny section there, that little arrow behind it is so much smaller, it's going through a bigger hole, mm -hmm. and it's not touching anything. It's not creating friction. It's not creating any drag. It's basically free-flowing through a hole. And the benefit of penetration with that type of design is the single greatest attribute to a small diameter arrow with a collar hmm. or an outsert. Um, and then after that, you know, you just want a durable arrow that's not going to break uh, if it encounters something. Because if it breaks, you now lose all the value of the weight of that arrow in your mass calculation. Right. Right. So... That, that that is the kind of the concept behind how I got here. It started with me setting up the most efficient penetrating arrow I could for my low speed, low performing trad bow, and then transferring that over to a compound. Well, if you took that same arrow and put it on a high performing compound, I mean, it basically, you know, shoot the gates off hell. Right. It ain't flat, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Right. That that and your uh the and the broadhead just kinda of play into that as you were kind of describing that low profile where you're slicing versus chopping, you know, um kind of fits the bill there too with the Evos. Yeah, well, you know, it's it everybody talks about the three to one mechanical advantage. And that doesn't have anything to do with the three inch long broadhead and one inch wide. It doesn't have anything to do with the actual um size of it. The three to one advantage is the blade angle. Mm-hmm. If you have something that long versus that wide, three to one, you have a very slight blade angle. The, the, the downfall to that traditional style three to one head is that it goes to a very sharp, long, skinny point, um, which is not durable. It'll roll. I'd rather have a broadhead blade snap and break or chip than roll, because if it rolls, you're screwed. Right. Penetration's gone, boys. So, um, so what, what we did is, you know, we basically copied the, the, the old Maasai tribe, which everybody does, um, or the people that do, that's where it originally came from. But you've got a point that has at the very tip, uh, a, a, a more durable, not snub nosed, but, but tougher point angle blade angle for a tough point that won't roll but having that convex shape it's very strong mm -hmm. uh, a round shape is 20 times stronger than a straight shape if it wasn't you know barrels wouldn't be round they'd be square well that would just look how uh, architecture of bridges right it's like bridges, the strongest bridges door so. openings yeah anything yeah round is stronger so so by having that radius shape what you're doing is is you're blending a super durable point, you're slowly transitioning it, transitioning it with a radius edge, and then you're rolling the corner 
and now you've got the three to one blade angle. Right. And then as you get further back, you're getting a four and five to one blade angle, which is zero resistance. So it's kind of a blend of the best of both worlds. It'd be great to have a, a, a three to one blade angle in a inch and a quarter long head. It's not achievable unless the cutting diameter was a half inch. And <laughs> so you don't want that. Right. right. Yeah. Right. right. So you have to, you have to blend this geometry to make it work. And, and that's why the heads are the way they are. And then if, I don't know if you noticed, but, the bleeder blades mm -hmm. are not like anybody else's bleeder blades. You know, ours are a very low profile three to one blade angle, long, you know, uh, low drag. And they're only slightly bigger than the ferrule and mm -hmm. the outsole. And the only reason that bleeder blade is there is to open up the path for the ferrule, the broadhead ferrule and the outsole behind it. So there's no drag. Same concept with the arrows, no drag, no, no contact. And that's the only job that that bleeder is doing is opening up that path because, you know, with a standard two blade head, a standard two blade is the greatest penetrating head design you can get because there's virtually zero resistance. Mm -hmm. The problem with it is, is that it creates a wound channel that is like a zipper or like a Ziploc bag, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, it cuts this perfectly s single slice, but when it's passed, you now have matching mirroring sides on either side of that wound channel that are going to marry perfectly right back up to each other. Mm -hmm. And it's going to seal up very quickly, and it's going to limit the blood flow. Right. It's also going to heal very quickly. So when I used to shoot a lot of two blade heads, you know, I've watched deer that were say shoulder shot or whatever. They would run out, lay down, and then they would just sit there and lick that wound constantly. Lick it, lick it, lick it, lick it constantly, constantly, constantly. And in five, ten minutes, that wound would have totally scabbed over, or at least coagulated enough to a point to where it's not free flow bleeding anymore. Mm -hmm. They get up, walk off, you don't find them. And so what the bleeder is there for is to open up the channel for the ferrule behind it and the, and the, and the outsert to reduce friction and drag. But it's also only there to disrupt that perfect seam of a two-blade <laughs> uh, wound channel. It's putting that little cross in it there that's, that's not having, not allowing it to be that perfect marriage of those two, two, you know, parts of the flesh joining right back up. Right. And it creates just enough to where it's going to allow that blood to continue to flow. Does that make sense? No, it totally makes sense. Cause I, uh, like two things, I shot the buck that I, that I killed in Iowa with, with, with an Evo this year. And, um, first what you mentioned, the toughness, like, I don't know how many deer I've shot in the past and had a pass through it, whatever, whatever close range, and that broadhead was basically dead because the, the, the front of it was now kind of rolled over, right? Or, right. you know, so I've had that happen in the past. So I totally know what you're talking about there. And then it, I got a full pass through. And so when I picked the, when I picked the arrow up, the, the, the broadhead was, was in almost perfect condition. And then, you know, what I think it was like 20 feet later, it was just like someone opened up opened that deer up and just piles and piles of lung blood as I found him. I mean, he only, he only went like 40 yards and it was the craziest thing. Cause when I hit him, like he didn't do a big mule kick. He just kind of jumped and stopped and looked around cause it happened so quick. You know what I mean? And it passed through so fast. He was just, he was look. he literally, I don't think know what happened to him, you know? And well, there, was, there was no, there was no shock. No, there was no resistance. There was no pressure. It literally zipped through with very little resistance, which is what you want. Yeah, because he literally just the, walked. The, he literally just walked off. Like he looked around after he jumped, and he looked around. I was like, "What the hell just happened?" And then he walked away, and I watched him walk down over this little knoll. And then that's that's exactly where I found him. Like he didn't run at all. He just literally walked away. Well, the the, the trad bow is what accelerated my learning curve um, on what an arrow needed to do to be a super efficient and kill very quickly. Um, I was very fortunate, Clint, because I got exposed to 
traditional hunting when I was 21, 22 years old, mm-hmm. uh, you know, working in a, in a, in a shop. So, um, that early exposure really taught me a lot about what it takes to be efficient with an arrow. And I remember, especially with a long bow and a recurve, they're so quiet and the air is moving so slow. It, there's just, it, it is not a lot of noise disturbance, you know, and I can't tell you how many whitetails I shot, you know, at home in Alabama to where they'd be feeding under a white oak tree or something. And I'd zip an arrow through them and it literally would just pop right through them, stick in the ground. They would hop two or three steps, look around and then put their head back down and start eating acorns again. And there was, there would be literally blood and pieces of lung pouring out of the, the, you know, the, the side of them, Mm -hmm. but they didn't know what happened. It, there was not a lot of resistance. It zipped right through with, very little friction and it's a function of a good flight, good geometry, low blade angle and super, super sharp. And that told me right there, I understand what it takes to kill them. Now, how do we translate that to compound shooters? Right. At the time that this was awakening was happening for me is when the overdraws, were coming onto the scene on bows Mm -hmm. and arrows were being cut 23, 24 inches. Um, you know, shooting six grains per pound arrows on 80 pound bows, you know, the same time I was actually understanding what it took. The industry was taking it so far polar opposite from it that, you know, it was just impossible for me to say, hey, guys, you don't really want this. Right. Let's use a regular rest. Let's put a 2216 aluminum arrow on it. A good, you know, two blade head, super sharp, super stable. No one listened to me. They wanted the overdraw. They wanted the short, you know, super light arrows. <laughs> they wanted the, you know, the hunter gray muzzy. And that was that was it. You couldn't convince them of anything else. Right. And, um. It was so funny back then, half the people I hunted with and the people that we set bows up for, they, they, they could not hit a Volkswagen at 50. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, it's just, it was a joke, you right. know? Um, so the beauty is, is that it's only taken 30 years, but the, the <laughs> heavy arrow movement has finally started to take hold. The problem is, <laughs> is that it's taken hold from a few outlets that are misleading to compound shooters. Um, Some of these outlets, you know, all of their testing and their, and their research and data points and all that bullshit is coming off of old, you know, non center shot trad bows from the eighties. Okay. And they're dredging up this information and throwing out these, you know, percentages of FOC, um, that are, that, that is, you know, being touted as this magic bean. Right. And for a 1980s, you know, shoot off the shelf longbow, high FOC is a magic bean because you almost can't tune those damn things. Right. So having that super, all your weight up front, a super light back in, you could shoot off that, you know, shelf that wasn't even cut to center shot. The arrow would flip out left, but it would recover super fast. Remember what we talked about earlier, quick yep. recovery. Yep. And under good conditions, it would out penetrate. Well, everybody's going, what's well, because all that weight's up front? It's pulling the arrow through. Nope. It doesn't have an engine. It's not front wheel drive. It doesn't pull shit. Right. Um, it, the, the arrow doesn't know. You know, the, the target doesn't know how the mass is distributed. It's mass times velocity. There's no other factors. Yep. The reason they got such incredible results with the high FOC is they were achieving better arrow flight off of shitty bows. Right. <laughs> because it's a, it's a shortcut to tuning. You follow what I'm saying? Yep, totally. 
So that's where all these results came from. Now you fast forward 30 years and you've got trad bows that are cut past center shot. So your arrow now is traveling through the center of the bow string travel. You have compounds that are so efficient that you almost can't screw them up. And so you don't need to trick the arrow anymore by putting 300 grains up front. You can distribute that weight more evenly. And by having it distributed more evenly, you've got a little bit more stable arrow as it in, in, interacts with limbs, twigs, crosswinds, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but the high FOC arrows, they're volatile. It's like a, when you spin a top and you watch how beautifully it spins. But as soon as it gets just a titch out of balance, it yeah. wobbles violently out of control. Yep. That is the, the basically the same reaction. So um, the heavy arrow movement is great, but it's coming from a place that they're saying you've got to start with all this weight up front and then figure out how to make it work behind it. And that's bad information. Right. Um, so what you want to do is you definitely want to build a heavy arrow. You definitely want to have more point weight. You don't want to have a perfectly balanced arrow. That's not how a projectile works. But what percentage that is doesn't have anything to do with the price of peas once it's over 10, 12 percent, which is kind of your standard if you're shooting, a, you know, a, an insert and a 125, 150, whatever grain head. Right. Once you get over that, it doesn't really matter what it is. What matters at that point is whatever it takes to get perfect arrow flight. Right. So if you can achieve perfect arrow flight at 15% FOC, that's what you should be hunting with. You know, if you push it to 23 because you think that's the magic bean, but you can't get consistent arrow flight, you've screwed yourself. Right. The other problem is, is that the only way to achieve the high percentages of FOC is to have a super light arrow, right? Right. Well, to have a super light arrow, you have to have a super light carbon shaft with super thin walls, which is going to break. Right. So if it breaks, it's all for naught. Right. It's it's one of the it's it's the old adage of you know it, the sum is or the sum is greater than the parts kind of thing, right? Where it's like you need to have consistency right. and quality at every at every moment and let each part of it do its job, its respective job, the way it should. To its optimal mobility, not don't overvalue one aspect of of the job. Essentially, that's right. You know, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because I think so. I think that's just in modern day life in general. People are always looking for that magic elixir. You know, as a it doesn't matter what it is. We could even take hunting for example, right? They're looking for, you know, that magic strategy or tactic that's going to put them on big deer the rest of their life. And the reality is, like the strategy and tactic is is work your ass off for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that's I mean? it. like that's the that's the that's the description it's not a uh setup under in, in in this scenario like that doesn't that doesn't exist right it's it's just putting in the work and it's i think it's the same whenever it comes to building arrows it's don't overvalue one aspect of it because not any one aspect is going to lead you to the promised land it's paying attention to each component of it and each you know variable of it and making sure that you're using you know, the best quality product or, you know, you know, assets that you can and build with the idea of having the optimum arrow flight, not a preconceived idea of what your weight or what your FOC or what any of that should be. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one of those things that, that, uh, you know, the, the problem is, is that so many, so many guys, get stuck on um they get so many guys get stuck on one thing mm -hmm. uh because they hear something and they go oh that's a shortcut right well the shortcuts are basically a function of not having a good foundation right and not having a good foundation is a recipe for failure. Um, there's no other, 
there's no other way to put it in anything you do. If you do not have a good foundation, it's not, it's going to be short lived. It's not going to be long term success. Yep. And that's where guys have got to get with their, with their archery stuff is that they've got to build a good foundation and understand why they're doing what they're doing and understand that it's, it's about being consistent and reducing factors that are going to, con- you know, contribute to failure. That That's it. There, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. And most of the hype and the, this is the latest, greatest things, nine times out of 10, that's all bullshit. Right. I mean, there's, there's no other word for it. Yeah. I agree with you, man. I think that's a good place to, uh, I think that's a good sentiment to kind of wrap this thing up on, man. Before I let you go though, would you mind telling folks out there where they can find out more about you, where they can find out more about day six? Yeah. Yeah. It's day six gears, the website and, um, uh, day six gear on Instagram and Facebook. That's it. We don't really do much on the Facebook, but we check it every now and then, but mostly just Instagram. Yep. So everyone out there listening, be sure to give uh, day six a follow and uh, be sure to pick yourself up some heavy arrows and broadheads for this upcoming season. Brian, I appreciate you coming on, buddy. I always look forward to chatting with you and uh, we'll have to do it again soon. Sounds good, bud. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five star rating and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. And hell, while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a subscribe there as well. I'll be super appreciative if you do those couple things for me. And before I shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, Skull Brew Coffee Company, and Gumleaf USA Boots. And until next time, We'll see y'all.